Guess what, cinephiles? It looks like we're not the only people exploring the world of Quentin Tarantino. Our local NPR station, KCRW, just produced a program that is unlike anything you've ever heard before. A dramatized exploration of how this unlikely artist beat the odds to become one of the greatest film directors of all time. It's called Fade In, Quentin Tarantino and Pulp Fiction. And not only do we have an extended interview with the director, writer, producer, and star of Fade In, Mark Ramsey, but if you keep listening after the interview, you will be able to hear part one of this incredible movie for your ears. Fade In, Quentin Tarantino, and Pulp Fiction. He never graduated high school. He couldn't spell anything. He couldn't remember anything. His handwriting was awful. He couldn't focus. But he loved movies, all movies, every kind. And more than anything, he wanted one thing, to write and make his own, his way. Get ready for a very special audio experience, a movie about a movie made of sound. Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where this week we are not entering the world of a great film, but instead entering the world of a great piece of audio storytelling. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roke. I'm a writer, producer, and host, voiceover artist here in San Diego, California, and very excited for this unusual interview we're about to have, Steve, uh, about uh, continuing our season of Tarantino. Well, it's so funny because as I longtime KCRW subscriber. I'm looking at those email blasts I get, and in, we're deep, deep in the midst of Quentin Tarantino. Up pops this email about this project called Fade In, Quentin Tarantino and Pulp Fiction. And we are very thrilled to welcome the producer, writer, and star of the show, Mark Ramsey. Mark Ramsey is an audio storyteller who has not only created full cast thrillers and horror shows for your ears, but also dramatized the stories behind some of your other favorite movies with projects like Inside the Exorcist, Inside Star Wars, Inside Jaws, and of course, what we're talking about with him today, which is Fade In, Quentin Tarantino, and Pulp Fiction. Mark Ramsey, welcome to The Cinephiles. Oh gosh, thank you, Steve and John. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm curious, you know, we we always start off with asking how we came to the particular film we're talking about. And I would love to know, how did you first come to Quentin Tarantino? What was your first Tarantino experience? I think early on, uh, my first experience really probably was this movie. Mm. Uh, more than anything, more than Reservoir, more than anything prior. Uh, and I remember thinking that this thing is overrated. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first thought. This is the way people are talking about this is just terribly overrated. And the excitement and the buzz, because, you know, in those days, nobody was better at building buzz than the Weinsteins at Miramax. Sure. They were the buzz kings. They were the A24 of their era, for those of you who appreciate deep references. <laughs> and uh, this movie was infamous more than anything else for kind of upending the way independent film saw itself and the way people saw independent film, because prior to this time, it was all kind of, you know, Elizabethan dramas and um, stayed BBC style movies. And suddenly there was this bloody, gutsy, crazy, outlandish thing from Quentin Tarantino. And people said, not only what is this, but who is that? Hmm. So you thought it was overrated. Did you become a fan or did you continue? Like, what was your evolution with the with Tarantino's films over the years? Well, I, you know, I'm always um, uh, suspicious of buzz. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> and, you know, I'm on the board of the Critics' Choice Association and we get thrown more PR than, you know, almost anybody else except Emmys, Oscars and, and SAG. And um, you just you just pummeled with this stuff. But as the portfolio began to build, what you could clearly see is this isn't a one-off. This is someone who has a distinctive taste, a distinctive style, an unbelievably deep appreciation for all film, which you don't normally see. You know, there are the people who like the um, effete stuff. There are the people who like the genre stuff. 
I mean, I'm watching with interest the debate over uh, is there or is there not such a thing as elevated horror, which I find just a ludicrous <laughs> debate on its face. Yeah. But the the idea that someone can literally appreciate every nook and cranny of film and then combine threads of all that into one original thing, I found really, really compelling. And I think that thread continued through his work to the present day. And I also think that the fact that he's created this totally arbitrary cutoff point for himself, <laughs> yeah. which I and everybody else hopes is just, you know, wishful thinking, but may not be. I think that automatically creates scarcity. I mean, anytime you talk about, you know, there's only going to be a couple more of these, or in this case, one more of these, people begin thinking, wow, I better really appreciate this or it won't come back again. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe it'll never come back again and I should appreciate it because it is so scarce. So scarcity provokes appreciation. And I think Quentin understands that. I am really curious how you came into what I think is a, a really unique art form and be one that I love. Like I, I started listening. I found these albums at the middle school library that had old time radio shows. And I listened to those things obsessively until, and John and I are both huge Orson Welles fan until discovering yeah. things like the Mercury Theater on the air. And I was one, and so I love the idea of telling stories through sound and it, it, in this form. And I was wondering, how did you come into it? How did you discover it? How did you decide that this was an area that you wanted to work in? Like many things, uh, sometimes you follow the path of least resistance into an area where you can make a, a, a creative, unique difference. And this was one of those cases. I've been working for years in and around the radio space, not on the air, but you know, behind the scenes. And it always occurred to me that there was so much more we could do with the medium than was being done. Radio, if anything, over the decades has gotten less interesting. Right. That's why podcasting exists, in fact, because it enters the drought that is what isn't on the radio anymore. I mean, most of the most popular podcasts are not repurposed television or radio shows. They're original podcast series. And that occurred to me as a tremendous opportunity, which is why, I don't know, five years ago now, when the medium was much younger, I walked into the office at Wondery in LA, where they had you know a handful of employees and a big whiteboard with all their shows coming up that are about six shows deep, and, and I said, I said, you know, I hear a lot of repurposed television podcasts. I hear a lot of public radio or public radio inspired podcasts. I said, where are the shows for the rest of us? <laughs> you know, where are the shows for the people who want to be entertained? Where, where is, you know, once, once upon a time I did a presentation for public media folks and I, I said, here's a matrix. Okay. You know, matrix, vertical, horizontal. Sure. Yeah. I said, top and bottom, entertainment, top news, bottom, left and right, dumb, smart. I said, smart news, public radio. I get it. Dumb news, commercial radio, dumb entertainment, commercial radio. I said, where's smart entertainment? Where's that category? Where do I find that stuff? Because yeah. you guys aren't making it at that time. They were not. Nobody was. And I said, there's your opportunity. This was years before podcasting even arose. So I walked into Wondery and I said, you know, I want to create something that is about something everyone can appreciate that's fundamentally about entertainment. And I want to use it as, I want to use a hook in it that will be familiar to everybody and of interest to everybody. So how about these movies that are evergreen, these movies that are popular, these movies that are legendary, these movies that are genre? Let's start with Psycho. And let's take people inside the making of Psycho, but let's also make it kind of one part documentary, one part drama, and one part true, one part fiction. And it was that kind of interesting combination that was deliberate from the beginning that formed the basis of what was inside Psycho, inside Jaws, inside The Exorcist, inside Star Wars, and a couple of other things that we did as well, which were really fun and, and fulfilling to make. And all of which, almost all of which were top five um, Apple podcast series when they were new. Jaws spent a bunch of time at number two. And those were the days when we could say number two, over, and we meant overall, mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> not yeah. number two in the arts category, you know? <laughs> number two, actually, period. 
there's Dirty John in this one, you know? <laughs> so that was very exciting. And it was fulfilling to be able to tell a story fresh, in a fresh way that people hadn't heard before. And the whole idea of, you know, the so-called single narrator approach, which is, you know, I don't do voices. I play roles, but we do, you know, little minor audio tweaks to illustrate distance between the characters or distance from the microphone or whatever that allowed me to essentially do all the characters. So it's more in the form of a story read to a child, you know, yeah. right. storybook where a parent is reading all the characters, but not necessarily doing all kinds of voices. I mean, the deal with voices, unless you can do them really well, don't do them. <laughs> Right. So this is what we did, and it ended up creating the foundation for a style of shows that Wondery did across many series, things like American History Tellers, and gosh, I can't even th think of all of them, but there were a number of Wondery series that were done along the same lines with this quasi-documentary slash dramatic approach, and it was just plain fun to do. It was fresh. It was new, and... Um, it tapped, I think, um, a vein of interest because people generally liked it. Some people didn't understand it. Some people said, wait a minute, inside Star Wars, where's George Lucas? <laughs> I said, no, no, no. Okay, you're not going to hear Lucas. You're not going to hear Tarantino on uh, Fade In. You're not going to hear it. I mean, that's not what this is. I said, you, this shouldn't surprise you that much. If you go to a movie and you see Brad Pitt playing, you know, or Leo DiCaprio uh, playing... Um, a historic character, you don't ask, well, this can't be real. <laughs> right. What? You say it's called a movie. And that's what this is. This is an audio movie. And um, I'm really proud of it. And I'm really grateful that KCRW allowed us to make it. Yeah, they're essentially based on true events, biopics, behind the scenes type of things. And, they, and they're cons easily consumable in 25-minute formats. They're infinitely entertaining. And I, I will push back on you a little bit. You do make some adjustments to your voice. Certainly, your, your John Travolta was adjusted. Well, if I can do it, if right, I can do exactly. it so easy, you know, right, whoa, right. where, where? <laughs> I mean, if it's that easy, and uh, Lucas was another one that's fairly close to my voice, but you yeah. know, it's uh, it's 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 a skill you either have or do not have, and if you do not have it, do not exercise it. Is my motto. That's fair. Especially Tarantino with that Australian accent in in Django on a Change, which, which is the film we're doing now. But I look at I look at your uh, lineup here as I'm looking right inside Star Wars, inside Jaws, inside The Exorcist, inside Psycho. The what was your process in going about selecting which of them? And of course, now with Fade and Inside Tarantino, which you've done four episodes on, what was the process in selecting which of these to dive into? Is it from a personal place? Did you do some study and research on this and found that, okay, this would be fun. This is more interesting because there are so many incredible movies that have been pop culture uh, touchstones. How did you land on all of these? And then is especially Tarantino. Well, a couple of things. First of all, it has to be of interest to enough people to make it worth my time and yours. Right. So when people say, gosh, I wish you would do, you know, Poltergeist, I'm thinking, eh. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, so that's number one. Number, you know, things like Psycho, Exorcist, those are, first of all, they were both genre. And I think genre has a lower bar for interest uh, to start with when you're talking about something that's iconic. And then beyond that, there has to be a level of scholarship available. For example, I would love, right now, I will, I will give you a hint. Okay. I would love to do that treatment on The Shining. Oh, yeah. But at this moment, you know, I know there's a book that uh, Lee Unkrich just did that's cost like $2,000 or something like that until they bring it down to retail. The scholarship's not available. There's just not that much written about it. So without that scholarship being available, there's very little I can do. Um, in the case of Tarantino, I will say, it's notable that, and Faden was made before Cinema Speculation came out. There was really no recent biography of Tarantino. Uh, the one I used was, I don't know, 20 years old, 15 years old, mm. something like that. So I was able to tap into his early life 
through that resource pretty well. And then I had to go to a million secondary sources. But obviously, there's no shortage of writing about him. (laughs) (laughs) I see new stuff about him every single week, which is pretty astonishing when you consider that, you know, at the moment, he's not making a movie. And he's got only, you know, so many under his belt. And yet, everyone loves to say, uh, look at what Quentin said about Star Trek, or look at what Quentin said about his favorite actor. So it's pretty astonishing. But um, so the, there has to be scholarship. I need some sources. They have to be sound. Um, and then I have to be interested in it personally. And then I have to think you're interested in it. And those three ingredients are really what determines it. Because it's an investment of time. Yeah. And it's not inconsequential. You have to read all these books. You have to read all these articles. You have to spread them out all over a table and figure out how you want to weave it together. And then you've got to find some kind of a theme. All of these series have a particular theme associated with it. It varies by series. Some are more tragic. Some are more hero's journey. This one, like Jaws, is more hero's journey. But they all have a particular theme. And if if there's not some person I can empathize with, um, then I'm less interested in it. For example, I actually wrote, and I wrote this uh, during uh, COVID. I had a lot of time on my hands, like so many did. And I thought, well, what should I do? Let me take a different approach on inside and do it in four episodes and see where I get. And I did that. And then I wrote another one, which I've got sitting in a drawer. (laughs) I've got a second season already written that I wrote a couple of years ago. And uh, there too, I had to find someone I embraced as as a hero, tragic or otherwise. And uh, I managed to do that. So those are really the ingredients that I go for. In this uh, four-episode series, you focus on um, Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. And you focus, obviously, on Tarantino's journey. The previous ones, uh, aside from Star Wars, right, you focused on one movie. Did you stop at Pulp Fiction because you felt like that's the zenith of Tarantino? And, the, and then from the rest, although those you could arguably those other movies that have come after Pulp Fiction are better. But this is the one that everyone knows. This is the one that is the gateway to Tarantino, Pulp Fiction. Is that why you stopped there? Or do you have plans for other seasons for the opus of Kill Bill or these other films that come on have come in after? I think if you back up, well, first of all, the value of the hero, the subject, yeah. and the content, the movie, have to be related. Mm-hmm. And if I were to say, if I could pick one movie that kind of symbolizes the trajectory of Tarantino, what would that movie be? I don't think it would be anything after the one that made him famous. Yeah. That doesn't mean that those aren't as good or better. Right. Um, It only means that those aren't as fundamental to his story and why his story is interesting. That's why I picked Pulp Fiction and... Uh, that's why I think I wouldn't go back to his of um, for anything after that. It, it's so interesting because it's almost like the opposite is from our approach in a weird way, which mm. is that like for you, it's the character in front of the movies. It's Quentin Tarantino as the hero is the center of your focus. And for us, Quentin Tarantino is certainly someone that we focus on and, and analyzing, but it's the movies that we're really trying to figure out. Cause we see him through those movies exactly and in our you conversation do. we discover more about him through those movies yeah but that's the fundamental difference between you know either a documentary or a making of mm. um a behind the scenes uh, a fundamental difference between that and a biopic right right where the person is at the howard hughes is at the center of the howard hughes movie right it's so funny thinking about what ends up on the on the cutting room floor because like for our audience they want all the information they can get every bit of behind the scenes data but like having made you know other films there are things that just don't advance your narrative and so it might be the most fascinating bit of trivia about pulp fiction but if it's not advancing the narrative of your character of quentin tarantino then it doesn't belong in your show and i'm kind of curious how you approach that how did you approach Mm -hmm finding the heart of the story, the spine of it that you wanted to tell. Because the story fundamentally is all about struggle and beating the odds. So anything that either 
advanced the challenge or advanced his overcoming of the challenge, which is fundamentally drama, anything that did one of those two things was what I uh, selected. So if I had moments that were difficult for him, I made sure those were in there. If I had moments that were achievements for him, I made sure those were in there. And anything else really didn't matter so much. I thought certain things like his relationship to his dad was just um, utterly uh, impossible to ignore. And uh, the treatment of it, a lot of the things that are written in this in this series, a lot of the words that come out of people's mouths are words that actually came out of their mouths. A lot of the things that I have Tarantino saying are things he actually said. Mm. I mean, the whole story with meeting his father at a diner whom he had never seen before was true. Um, can I have a seat? Tarantino looked up. Their eyes met. This man, the way his face was made, his hair, he had a pack of luckies in his back pocket. Tarantino had never seen him before, and he knew exactly who he was. I think those are clearly moments that shape people, and that's why I thought that uh, that kind of a moment was something I would particularly favor. And then there were certain other moments that were just color. I mean, there, there were moments that kind of color your appreciation of the man and his sensibility. The idea that um, he was in love with Captain Crunch with Crunch Berries. This is not just cereal. This is Captain Crunch, the crystal of cereals, okay? What are those, what are those round things? Are you kidding? Those are crunch berries, ma'am. You know, somebody said to me once, if there's one thing that people hate in podcasts, it's the sounds of people chewing. <laughs> and I said, well, my um, segment of Tarantino eating crunch berries and describing the sensation went on for about two minutes solid. <laughs> Every bowl is a delightful minefield of delicious Fabergé eggs. And I wouldn't have replaced it for the whole world because it's just entirely too long and yet so entirely satisfying, at least I hope so, because it's funny. And most of that content is stuff he actually <laughs> said. Mm. So that's one of my favorite moments in the series. And yes, I was actually eating Crunch Berries, so it was, <laughs> uh, it was audio verite. I'm glad. It's very important that you got that right. <laughs> I mean, it's funny. That, that moment to me is classic kind of Tarantino that we would see in a movie. That's that's the Royale with cheese. That's, you know, the, all of the, that's the tipping conversation in Reservoir Dogs. It's all of these sort of monologues that he likes to get into about some bit of minutia that is really interesting. So it, it both was an interesting moment in your podcast and it fits in perfectly, I think, with Terrence. Right. So it does both of those things. I mean, those moments are gold. Yeah. So those are what I, I really look for. Uh, anything to create, not just to illustrate someone's personality, but why they want what they want, what it is that they want, why it's worth having. And more important, yeah, I think it serves as a lesson to you. All of these stories are stories for people who make things. That's what they all are. Yeah. They're all stories about creative people who are trying to do something against the odds and either achieve it or fail to achieve it in a way that has a lesson attached to it. And I think that's really important. The second season of Fade In, if KCRW wants to do it, the one that I've already written, is on Alien. Ooh. And uh, Ridley Scott is not the center of it. The center of it is a guy named Dan O'Bannon. Sure. <laughs> that you guys will know. Yeah. But a lot of people will not know Dan O'Bannon. And yet he co-wrote the original script. And I think it's safe to say that he is kind of the forgotten hero of the story. And it's a much more tragic tale than um, any story about Ridley Scott would be. I just found him much more compelling than Ridley. But by the way, it's funny. I believe every single movie you've mentioned, Jaws, Star Wars, Psycho, The Shining, Alien, all movies we've done on The Cinephiles. Yeah, of so, course. Yeah. <laughs> because if it's not iconic, why should I bother? <laughs> yeah. So w one of the things that we've talked about a lot on the cinephiles is because it's such a huge part and an underappreciated part of film is sound design. Mm. And with your work, it's all sound design. 
So I was wondering if there is a particular approach, if if you're thinking about it in the writing process, it's, it's something that really cre- gets created in post. Like how how do you approach? Because the the sound field of your shows are really really complicated. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on. Meanwhile, the chorus from every major studio in town was clear, distinct, and unanimous. Pass. 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 Vivid sound design, and it's completely different. the The person in charge of the sound design is a guy named Jeff Schmidt, who is incredibly talented. Yeah. I walked into Wondery on day one with him, and introduced them to him and him to them. And um, he's done a lot with them and others since then. He is really one of the top drawer sound designers in the podcast space. He's done Dirty John. He's done Doctor Death. He's done a ton of stuff with Wondery and with others. He did AfterShock with me with David Harbor. And uh, I try and work with him on everything. And my attempt is always the same thing, which is, let's see if Jeff can do this. (laughs) So in other words, let me try and create an impossible scenario because I know he's going to find a creative, clever, amazing way out. And that's what he manages to do every time. Uh, Sometimes I'll tell him something I want to do. He'll come back with something else and I'll say, you didn't do what I asked you to do. And I'll say, but I liked it. You know, when he does something different, it's always for a good reason. And his sensibility is uh, second to none. So I trust him implicitly. So that's why I intentionally write it for audio. I mean, I know the rules of writing for audio. I know what to do and what not to do. And I try and provoke the production process. There was a thing in Inside Star Wars where we did a montage of time passing. It was Spielberg going to the studio. I'm sorry, Inside Jaws. Spielberg going to the studio every day. And every day the shark was not working. It was that thing. So we had we built this montage, which was the alarm bell goes off. He's making the coffee. He's drinking the coffee. He's getting in the car. He's driving to the studio. The shark is not working. That's it for the day. Everybody goes home. Turn on the TV. Go to bed. Wake up. Coffee. <laughs> car. Shark not working. All over again. So we did this and we made this amazing montage. Jeff made this amazing montage. And I said, Jeff, you have no idea how good that is because people aren't used, people are used to seeing these kinds of montages on film and TV. People are not used to hearing them. Yeah, right. And it just sounded not only fresh, but you could picture everything as it was happening. There was nothing left to the imagination that wasn't, you know, made visible through the sound. And I just thought it was brilliant. And I think things like that, not enough people appreciate the the mastery involved in something like that because it really is special. You're not often asked to do it. So when you're asked to do it, that makes it all the more special. Yeah, I recently hosted a um, panel at Comic-Con last year that was focused on a non or a fiction podcast. It was fascinating and the sound design that they created for this to put you in the environment was incredible and then hearing your show the same thing when i'm hearing them on set you know doing the setting up for the dance and all this kind of stuff when i'm hearing them at the coffee shop it's, it's, it's how many cups of coffee and all this i'm in the environment in the world that is being created and those are maybe some of my favorite moments in the four episodes of this. So certainly the sound design deserves a lot of credit. Do you have some favorite moments over the, over those four episodes of uh, fade in with Quentin Tarantino that you can hit on? And for people who are listening to us and haven't heard it yet might be watching out for when they get to them in those four episodes. I do. In fact, I think the, uh, crunch berries certainly is my favorite because (laughs) it's just so funny and just so entirely too long. (laughs) Mm, It's like heroin. It's like your mouth is chasing a crunchy dragon, you know? And like heroin, there's a price to pay. It's an example of breaking all the rules and yet appreciating what you've done anyway. Uh, so that's one example. I'm I'm sympathetic to 
uh, the moment when I have him in his diner and he looks over and sees um, Adam West, Batman. The table across from me, one guy sitting there, some Adam West looking motherfucker. People kept coming up to him with autograph books. Are you Adam West? Are you Batman? Can I have your autograph? And all of them, he said, no, 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 you got the wrong guy. And they would leave, which is not true, by the way. Um, <laughs> And Tarantino says, well, you know, why you are Adam West? I know you're Adam West. Why don't you tell people you're Adam West? And he paused to shovel some hash browns in his mouth. And then he said, son, I can never measure up to the man they imagine. So I keep their dream alive. And that's symbolic of the entire relationship that he imagined with his father. Mm. Mm. because I, and of course I have his father coming into the same diner later, which actually did happen. And the revelation of who this man is adds further damage to the non-relationship that they had. So Adam West was right. <laughs> <laughs> that's why that scene was there. So that's a particular favorite. I also like, there's a scene where John Travolta is just shocked to be regarded by Tarantino as this forgotten genius. That was a great, great scene, man. And Tarantino says, no, I want you for this role. And, and Travolta is driving home. I have him driving home from Quentin's apartment and just stopped at a light thinking, what if I can't do it? What if the suits are right? What if the whole fucking town is right? What if my best days really are over? Maybe I am less sincere now. What if, what if I actually get this gig and fail? What if I'm not what Tarantino thinks I am? And, you know, if you're a human being, you don't need to interview Travolta to know that's how he felt. Yeah. You know how you'd feel if you were him. And that's all I drew on to create that moment at that light where he had to decide on what to do. And he turned a certain direction and the certain direction he turned was symbolic of the turn in his career and right. his life at that time. Yeah. So those kinds of little gems are hidden in there if people choose to, to see them. Um, and then there was one other moment, uh, but it involves me giving away the ending, which okay. We're not I don't know if I should do. You guys oh. have heard it all the way through. Let's just say that if you listen at the very beginning and you listen at the very end, your attention will be rewarded. <laughs> <laughs> Without spoiling it, it is a definitely a very interesting moment. Um, I want to. I have to ask you, and this goes into the uh, fact versus fiction area, mm. because of course we did Pulp Fiction several years ago, and I had never read or seen anywhere. Did Quentin Tarantino live in John Travolta's actual apartment? <laughs> is that a true thing? That seems to be the case. Wow! wow. Travolta recognized the apartment. And now it could be that it was a different apartment in the same building that had the same layout. I don't know, but that was a building that Travolta was familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's so, it's so funny. There were several moments in listening to your thing. It was like, damn it. I wish I knew that when we did our show, that would have been a good piece of information. <laughs> yeah. I think um, the Matt Dillon moment, the Lawrence Fishburne moment, I was really surprised by those kinds of things, which I didn't know about. And I pictured, I, I started to picture, I sat for like five minutes picturing Daniel Day Lewis, Matt Dillon and Lawrence Fishburne in this movie rather than the actors that did become in this movie, did get into this movie. And I was like, this would be, it would have been such an interesting challenge for yeah. Tarantino, but. Well, you know what? It's funny yeah. because it, that, that's true. I always try when I did these series to touch on the what ifs. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're so interesting to consider, well, you know, who would have been cast in this role if not Tony Perkins and Psycho? Yeah. Just because I think it's so interesting for people to consider you know, gosh, what would it have been like if it had been that person? What I will tell you, though, is this, that I kind of have this belief that all of these things that are great because of who's in them would be great in a different way, but still great, mm. I think. Okay. Yeah, John Travolta is very specific, but, you know, yeah. I, I don't know if Uma, Thurman's, if Uma Thurman is that specific. I mean, Travol there's only one Travolta, but I think he could have done other people like Uma Thurman. So it would have been very interesting. Right. And I think it just would have been different. But I also think one of the allures of that film is because it is the rebirth of John Travolta because of the fact that he is. So that adds even more legend to the film. I think for a lot of people who come upon it, especially for me, who is a contemporary, grew up 
when he was famous as a welcome back, welcome back Cotter as a kid, and then seeing the change and the difference, and you become cynical about actors who lose their status, and you wonder, can they find their way back? And it was that film that kind of really launched him back. Because, of course, there were older actors in Reservoir Dogs, but none of them had the same kind of legendary status as Travolta in the way they returned. And then that became a staple of Tarantino films going forward, like Robert Forster, Bam Greer, other people that he brought back. So it's a Robert Forster is a great example. Robert yeah. Forster and I are both from Rochester, New York, originally. Oh, wow. and, uh, and I remember him saying that uh, yeah, I think he was, he was down to doing seminars yeah. at high yeah. schools for kids when he was kind of snapped out of that world by Tarantino and it reintroduced to uh, the movie public. And, uh, you know, we're all better for it. Yeah. One of the things about Travolta is I think it fits into something that we've sort of observed about Tarantino's movies in general, which is that he never wants you to forget the fact that you're watching a movie. And mm -hmm. the fact that you're aware when Travolta gets up to dance, you're having a meta moment. You're not just watching this character get up and dance. You're watching John Travolta get up and dance. Yeah. And I think, and as opposed to, I picture, what is Daniel Day-Lewis known for? Daniel Day-Lewis is known for so completely absorbing himself in the character that he just is that character. And so it almost eliminates the, the meta-ness of the experience, if that makes sense. I think that's a good thought. And I, I, I think it illustrates... Another, I think, again, I tried to tap into that for this series to say, you know, it's not quite real, is it? Right. Um, yeah. You know, in Glorious Bastards, uh, it turns out there wasn't really, they didn't really kill Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are elements of this which are intentionally hyperbolic in ways that are designed to delight you because they're made by a guy who grew up delighting in the moving image. Right. And I think that there are, I, I, I'll tell you, I, I, there are so few people, I think, that have his depth of knowledge or that even want to have mm. his depth of knowledge mm. that you know you're in the hands of a craftsman. This is why earlier I was talking about the difference between, you know, horror and so-called elevated horror. And, I, you know, I've tried to explain to people that don't use the term elevated, use, use the term craft. You know, focus on craft because there can be such a thing as a horror movie that isn't craft and a horror movie that is craft. <laughs> and that doesn't mean one is more popular than the other. That just means one is made with more principles wrapped up in it than the other. And one is a better made film than the other. That doesn't mean it's more popular. And I think that's true of, of, of Tarantino's stuff. There's a lot of craft in it. And the craft is um, more specific to him than specific to some of the people who, you know, advise you on how to write screenplays and make movies. Uh, when you're, you're really talking our language when you're talking about craft yeah. like that. I mean, that's what we spent the last seven years digging into. And one thing I'll say, I have mixed feelings about certain Tarantino uh, moments or certain Tarantino films, but we've said it. I can't tell you how many times we have brought up what a consummate craftsman he is mm -hmm. in, in discussing his films. It's one of the things that elevates his films from out of the genres he takes them from, right? right. Those genres are B and C genres in essence. And there, sometimes there's genres that film historians and film critics are looked down upon. And yet he has been able to recraft them. He just recrafts them in a way that is much more palatable. And you start to find why there's such a devotion and love for those B or C level type of genres um, in the world of people who love films. And I think that's a great thing. I agree with that. And also I think he, he's, he's unafraid to let people talk for three pages. <laughs> yeah. And as you know, no one, you'll never get a note that says, add more pages of monologue. <laughs> right. <laughs> that note never comes. And that's, which is why the actors love him, certainly. But uh, that allows him to do things with character that you're just not used to seeing. And you find yourself riveted in a chair watching people talk, which is what you thought you went to the movies to avoid. <laughs> right? Yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, I want to circle back to something you mentioned earlier. You mentioned his relationship or, or lack of a relationship with his father. And this is something that we discussed a lot is, is mm. how important do you think his 
lack of a father figure or his search for a father figure, or there's also, you know, the boyfriends of uh, his mom and, you know, the, those circumstances, how influential is that on the kind of filmmaker he became? I think it's influential on every guy who grows up in that situation. Mm. Um, and I, I can only speak to it from the male perspective, which is why I say every guy. But I, I think that that matters. It makes an imprint on you. I know it's made an imprint on me. I mean, I'm not in that situation, but I, you know, uh, know that my relationship with my dad has had influence over the way I write what I write. Um, I tend to write a lot of distant dads. <laughs> <laughs> so when I find, and by the way, they're not hard to find. <laughs> I want to ask you about the creation of something like this and then working with KCRW. We've met your, the executive producer at KCRW for this um, fantastic series. And the question becomes, did you create the series, record the series, do the series, then run it by them, and then they offered edits, changes? Or did you work in conjunction with KCRW to make sure you produce something that they found to be easy to put on and promote on their airwaves? Well, okay. First of all, it's a, a, a podcast purely, so it's not on their air. Uh, gotcha. there, are, there are terms that, it, there are words in this series that would not be appropriate for the FCC. <laughs> That's you can fair. Imagine. That's fair. Yes. So, um, but this was the first time they told me the first time that they partnered with any outside producer to make anything and anything that they haven't made themselves. So it was a big deal. I had a pre-existing relationship with them in a number of areas. And I had a produced pilot and I shared it with them. They were excited by it. They wanted to do something with it. They read the script. They had very few notes and we went and we made it. So, um, it basically sold to them on the basis of the pilot and on the presence of the script. So I had it all conceived from day one. They were concerned about it, obviously, because, you know, you're not the only donor to KCRW, there's also a guy named Quentin Tarantino <laughs> <laughs> who turns out as a supporter of KCRW and no one wants to rock that boat. But I said to them and they understood that there's nothing in this that he would find anything other than, um, uh, complimentary is probably the wrong word, but illuminating and fairly representative, mm. even if not actually true. And by the way, no one will appreciate the fact that not everything in this series is true more than Quentin Tarantino. Right. That's a great so, point. So he of all people. Yeah, I'm messing with history. Yeah, you you killed Hitler, man. Like <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um do you know have you have you sent it to him? I don't know that he's heard it. I, I don't know. I mean he's got a lot of friends at KCRW. He's got people who can get it to him. Um because it's on KCRW and because KCRW has the profile it has both in LA and uh, west of the 405, it's well established in the community. These things tend to be catnip for people in the business, mm. right? <laughs> so certainly, people around him have heard. I know that uh, people at Amblin heard Inside Jaws. Oh wow! Mm. Um, I don't know if Spielberg himself did. My brother actually works for Spielberg and never had the guts to ask him. <laughs> but I, I don't know if he's heard it or not. Uh, if he has, um, I'd love to talk with him about it. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> and, uh, but he has his own podcast. So who knows? Maybe he can have me on there. <laughs> there you go. I was curious, what is, is there a moment in the show that was just the hardest one to pull off that you really struggled to figure out how to make it work? I always worry about endings hmm. because in my view, the ending has to make the whole thing worthwhile. You can't kind of just float to the end. You know, you've got to feel something at the end this literally, I think you've got to feel something at the end, which makes the journey worthwhile. And that is always in my mind. And that's why I came up with the fairly uh, clever solution here that I did that I was super proud of. I mean, there's something different in every series. And um, in Inside Jaws, it was Spielberg showing Ready Player One. Uh, to a uh, South by Southwest crowd. And I guess the sound system wasn't working and Spielberg was, you know, well, he was 10 years past his last hit, his last popular hit. And he didn't know how this was going to be received. And again, that 
the AV wasn't working. Nothing was working. They had to restart the movie and how would it play? And I created this whole sense that said, this is going to be a disaster. And then he gets the standing ovation, which was, you know, the emotional moment, the emotional punch I was looking for at the end of that series. This one has a different kind of emotional punch, which I really appreciated. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not going to say what it is. But it's, it definitely illustrates that this is not a documentary. <laughs> we talked about craftsmanship here just a few minutes ago. And I want to ask you, you know, obviously in creating something like this, just like you create a movie or whatever as, we, as we've compared it to, there are deleted scenes. There are things that don't make the cut. And there's always, or usually, the toughest cut. Do you have a scene that you can tell our listeners from these four episodes that you cut, maybe it was produced and recorded and sound mixed, and then you had to cut it, or you wrote it, but had to cut it at the end before you could make it happen. That was the hardest cut for you. I, you know, because I'm really writing to a particular time mm -hmm. goal and I have control over what goes in, I do my own editing. Ah. And, um, my, of, of content, I mean, so, uh, you know, is, is this scene worthwhile? For example, you know, I elected not to, there's nothing about Harvey Weinstein's shenanigans that I felt right. added any value to this story. Um, his presence in this story is important, sure, but it's certainly not about him and his extracurricular activities. So I, I toyed with that a little bit, but I thought, you know, what does that add to this story just because it's true? You know, just because it's true doesn't make it interesting. We've been talking so much about craftsmanship. You've been studying Tarantino the way we've been studying Tarantino. Do you learn anything from him? Was there anything that you went in terms of your writing, in terms of the way you approach stories that you go, oh, this is an interesting thing that he does? Well, I think the fact that he does things in a nonlinear fashion. Mm -hmm. Many of the inside series uh, stories touched on historical inspirations for the story. So we touched on real life shark killings for inside jaws. We touched on some of the, the Ed Gein story for inside psycho. So it was kind of a mix of the origin story and the movie and the people who made the movie. And what I've learned is don't be constrained by history and don't be constrained by facts. <laughs> what, what, That's what, what the, I've learned. One of the quotes we had uh, heard for, from the making of Django is, don't let accuracy get in the way of a good story. <laughs> well, you know, and then you, you, you'll hear screenwriters all the time talk about the difference between what's uh, true, what's factual, and what's true, right? Yeah. That facts are not truth, that truth is a deeper thing than any fact. And representing the truth of a moment, of a scene, of a story is more important because that's what resonates. Otherwise, you're just dealing in, you know, a, a, a to-do list. But the truth of a story is what resonates. And that's why I found Tarantino's story so compelling, why I find Dan O'Bannon's much more tragic story so compelling. I mean, there's this, here, I'll tell you one story that's in the second season that, you know, KCRW has not yet uh, told me that they want to make, but Apparently, I did an interview with someone who said that, you know, O'Bannon was the guy who he had some stomach issues throughout his life. And those stomach issues were uh, presumed to be the inspiration for the creature that comes out of the chest. And towards the end of his life, he would take this stuffed alien creature, <laughs> face hugger. And he would just lay back in his chair and put it on his face. <laughs> <laughs> and that's both kind of entertaining and also, frankly, a little bit sad. Yeah. yeah. And that's something I wanted to kind of capture there, that you can do this great thing. You can be twisted around by, you know, the studio folks, by the, the people who went on to produce Alien and the people who rewrote Alien. And then it becomes big and all of a sudden the people who rewrote it says it's big because of them. And the people who originally came with it said, no, it's big because of us. And who are you going to believe? Uh, the, <laughs> the people who have licensing rights forever or the guy who co-wrote the original story? I mean, that's a tragic story. And it just goes to show you the lesson there is you don't know how it's going to work out, 
But if it's in you, no pun intended, you better let it out. <laughs> it's 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 funny you be talking about the the who's gets the credit. There's also all the stuff you dealt with with Roger Avery and in pulp and that's I, I think you handled that really well. It's a very difficult, you know, tightrope to walk on how you parse that s- situation. You know, I wonder after after writing that and doing all the research on that because none of that was made up. That was all, mm. you know, well reported um, stuff. But I wonder how they can do a podcast together today. <laughs> yeah. And I, I wonder if, in fact, they've ever broached that. Um, I wonder. I mean, they're on record over the years saying various things about it, but uh, knowing what's in the series and knowing that they do a podcast together today, I wonder what happened between those two things. It, it might eventually come up. You lead to it and you make it an event episode. They might mm. be just craftily waiting. I want to ask you, as a voiceover artist, I really found your uh, the other actor in this P, in these four episodes, the actress, uh, excuse me, I don't remember her name right now, but I thought she did a wonderful job with a lot of the characters that she was asked to portray from girlfriend to script supervisor to driver to all these different parts that were so essential to to Uma. They were so fascinating to listen to. What was the process in casting her? And is she a friend of yours? And what was the process in directing her to uh, give the performances you needed for this piece? Well, if you go back to the Inside series for Wondery... um, in those days, it was all single narrator, and I di- I remember them saying to me, "Don't you want a, a female voice for the female roles?" And I said, "No, it's all going to be me." <laughs> <laughs> okay, because if you can suspend your belief for the male voices, you can sp- suspend your belief overall. Again, it's like reading a, a story to a child. I thought that it would be interesting to at least acknowledge the fact that adding a little bit of variety and a little bit of gender verisimilitude might make sense. <laughs> so. Um, I uh, brought in a, uh, someone who's worked with us before on previous projects, Carissa Vacker, who does a lot of audiobooks. Yeah, who's a, a fine actress. She was in the David Harbor project with us, Aftershock, and um, she did a great job here. And she allowed us to have at least that kind of rooting in gender reality. Hmm. <laughs> she played all the female roles. I played all the male roles. But I'm reminded of the. <laughs> There is comedy inherent in playing the female roles, I will tell you. <laughs> oh, yeah, and sure. There was, uh, memorably, if you go back to Inside Jaws, there's a scene where uh, Spielberg is doing uh, his Night Gallery episode for Rod Serling, and which was, you know, memorably about a blind Joan Crawford. And Joan Crawford, yeah. And he has to go into Joan Crawford's apartment, and she's, you know, she's acting blind. So she's tripping over things. So just the sound of me being blind Joan Crawford (laughs) in her her apartment while Steven Spielberg comes to visit was funny. And I think, you know, there's, there's not enough funny stuff in podcasts (laughs) in my view. It's hard to make scripted pods that are actually funny, not just entertaining, but funny. I'm not talking about comedian podcasts with interviews. I'm talking about scripted, funny stuff. And there are certain moments where you say that one hit it and Joan Crawford, you know, wandering around her apartment, bumping into things. That was just funny, especially in my voice. That, that's why I go back to the old radio days. There's yeah. the, it used to be, there was everything, you know, there was comedies and thrillers and action and, you know, all that stuff. And we just sort of, I think we've lost the connection and maybe you're reforging that connection to that old art form. Well, it, it's funny. They, they had me do for the KCRW show, the treatment. Mm. A thing they call the treat, which I guess is a little short, something that inspired you. And uh, the thing that I did was on, as you mentioned, Orson Welles, which a lot of people, a lot of people forgotten him, but he was a a very youthful giant in Broadway theater Mm. in the early days of radio. And um, I was, when I was a kid, I was at a screening of, of Kane. And the guest of honor for that screening was Ruth Warwick. Oh, wow. Who was Charles Foster Kane's first wife, the niece of the president of the United States, Emily Norton. And she watched the whole thing with the audience from the front row. And obviously she had seen it a million and one times. And afterwards she had some comments. 
And it was great because she talked about kind of the lesson that she got from Wells. And uh, that lesson was in some ways transported to the final moments of this series. Because uh, I think I had her words coming out of Quentin's mouth. Mm. <laughs> because she made a comment that he had told her, that Wells had told her that, you know, do what's in your heart. I'll paraphrase, but do what's in your heart and don't sell out uh, because uh, the only thing worse than uh, selling out and succeeding is selling out and failing. <laughs> <laughs> and that essentially came not just from Tarantino, but from Orson Welles via Ruth Warwick all those years ago, which goes to show you where these things come from. Yeah, that's cool. I know we got to wrap up. I want to ask you one last, or from my side, one last question. It may seem a simple question, and maybe you've been asked this question a number of times, but I've noticed that there is an influx of people who are starting to find what you do as something they're aspiring to. So as someone who's been successful in doing this for the last few years, is there some advice? Is there some thing or lesson that you've discovered yourself as you've been successful in writing these and creating these and finding an audience for them that you could pass on to some young person who's listening to us right now as one of our listeners who would be inspired by it to create something like this or their own uh, fictional approach to a story? Yeah. Okay. So let's give a fuller view of the kinds of stuff that I'm working on right now so people understand yeah. how that how that answer relates to them. Because while we've done the fade in project, we've all in the inside stuff before that, we also produced uh, aftershock last year with David Harbour, Jeffrey Dean Morgan and Sarah Wayne Callies who wrote it. And that um, put us in a position to do this kind of homage to the twilight zone that we did this past year called dark sanctum with Bethany joy lens from one tree Hill and Clive Standen from Vikings and Michael O'Neill from Seabiscuit. It's so much fun to work with actors. <laughs> so that's one of the real attractions to me. And they were really enthusiastic and really helpful. And we ended up getting an Ambie nomination for the effort, uh, for performance, which was really wonderful. Right now it's on Wondery Plus mm -hmm. behind the paywall, but it's about to be available uh, for free. And now, as a matter of fact, right now, we're in the midst of casting a uh, full cast version of A Christmas Carol. Oh, wow. Oh, fun. And we just are lining up the cast for that today. And we've got some good names in that that people will have heard of. And then we hope for a second season of Fade In. We hope for a second season of um, Dark Sanctum as well. So I mention all of that to say that it begins with making what you want to make and not asking the question, what's the temperature of the market? Because if I had asked the question, in fact, I did ask the question, what's the temperature of the market? before we made Dark Sanctum. And they said, well, here's what people are not buying. They're not buying uh, limited series. They're not buying horror. They're not buying full cast. They're not buying short episodes. They're not buying... <laughs> they went through this long list that was everything that Dark Sanctum was. And we made it anyway. We wrote it anyway. We started making episodes anyway. And when people heard the episodes, all of a sudden interest materialized. So nobody knows anything about anything. The key thing is make it if you want to make it and because you want to make it, not because somebody else wants to make it or you think somebody else might buy it if you make it. Second, I would say is make what you make as well as you can. There's a notion that if you can't get your screenplay made as a movie, you can always get it made as a podcast. Well, you didn't write it to be a podcast, which means it's going to be an awful podcast. A book is a bad movie. A movie is a bad book. Make it for what you're going to produce. Don't settle for audio because you think it's more doable than film just because it is. Um, it's not going to be a good podcast if it's written as a screenplay. Third is really as part of making it as well as you can, make sure your actors can act. <laughs> yeah. Not every person who calls themselves an actor can act. Mm -hmm. And not every person who is a voice talent can act. Not every person who does audiobooks can act. So you need to have a sense of who's actually good. I mean, 
when Michael O'Neill, who is just wonderful, did the narrator role for Sanctum, he asked questions like, can you give me some of the music you're going to use so that I can read according to that music? Wow. He wanted that environment. And as Sarah Wayne Callies once said to me, actors are not vending machines, um, <laughs> sure. which I appreciate. So those are really, I think, the main things. And then more than anything, make sure you're making something that matters to you. And if it matters to you, whether or not it becomes a hit, at least you will have made something that matters to you. And that's worth more than all the hits in all the world. That's great, Mark. Um, Mark, it's been such a pleasure having you on the show. And I feel like this is a great culmination of all of the <laughs> Quentin Tarantino we've been digging into for so long and really enjoy it. Once again, the show is Fade In, Quentin Tarantino and Pulp Fiction. It's available everywhere. Podcasts are sold. Uh, Mark, I don't know if you do the social media thing, if you want people to reach you, how would they go about doing that? They can find me at Mark Ramsey Media on Twitter. I don't do too much on uh, Insta right now. Um, but that would be the best place to find me and anywhere that uh, uh, you connect with KCRW. Um, and we, of course, will have links to your show on all of our social media, which, of course, you can do a search for The Cinephiles on Facebook. It's Cine underscore Files on Twitter, The Cinephiles podcast on Instagram. And you could subscribe to our show at all the usual places. If you haven't already, please leave your reviews on Apple Podcasts. They really help. If you want to buy or stream Every single movie that Quentin Tarantino has ever made, you could do so through our website at cinephiles.net. You could support the show at patreon.com slash the cinephiles. And you can reach me at SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram and enterprise incidents for all of your Star Trek needs. John, how would people find you? You can always find me at the Roca says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, the outlaw nation on Twitch and my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash John Roca says, and my other podcasts, the geek buddies and the hot mic. And uh, once again, Mark, thank you so much for coming you, on Mark. the show. It's been such a great conversation. And I think that's it for this week. We'll be back next time with another great film on The Cinephiles. This is not a documentary. It's not an oral history. This is a movie made of sound, and you are in it. From KCRW, I'm Mark Ramsey, and this is Fade In, Quentin Tarantino, and Pulp Fiction, inspired by the true story. Episode 1. Nineteen eighty-seven, Manhattan Beach, California. Tucked into the corner of an out-of-the-way strip mall, a tiny video rental shop called Video Archives. This is it, let's go in. It's on Top Gun, you sure that's the movie you wanna rent? Okay. Hello? Where is everybody? Jesus. Sorry, I was taking a piss. Ah, I washed my fucking hands. I didn't wash my fucking hands. You wanna wait while I, no, 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 that's, that's okay. Just don't touch me. We're in a hurry, me and my son wanna rent a movie. Great. Italian exploitation, psycho bitty, spaghetti western, Bollywood, martial arts, sonic comedy, Luca Giallo. No, I don't know what any of that is. I just, we just want to rent Top Gun. Top Gun, that's right. Is there something wrong with Top Gun? No, no, how old's your boy? He's nine. Huh. He's too young, man. You, you don't want Top Gun. What? Why? Because Top Gun is a story about a man's struggle with his homosexuality. Uh, excuse me? What now? It's, a, it's about a bunch of fighter pilots. Going gay. What? Listen, you've seen the movie, right? Well, yeah, but oh, think about it. You got Maverick, right? Tom Cruise, he's on the edge, man. Boy, girl, he's on like a sexual teeter-totter. And you got Iceman, right? And his whole crew, they represent the gay man. And they're like, go the gay way, Tom. What are you talking about? Kelly McGillis is his love interest. Right, and she symbolizes 
heterosexuality, see, playing by the rules. And she's like, no, no, go the straight way. And they're like, no, Tom, go the gay way. Uh Uh-huh. So he goes to her house, right? And they're hanging out like they're going to have sex, but they don't. What does he do? He gets naked and he showers. Then he climbs on his motorcycle, his hog, and he runs away. And she's like, what the fuck? Over your ears, Billy. Sorry, she's like, what the F? She's like, why won't this guy have sex with me? What's wrong with me? Oh, I know. And in the very next scene, she's in an elevator, dressed like a guy, like Iceman. She's got the aviators and the cap. She's like, this is how I have to keep this guy on the straight way. I got to dress like a dude. Uh huh. But see, the gay way is like this fucking Jedi fucking force. It's just too powerful. So at the end, when Maverick's in the air fighting the MiGs, victory is the orgasm whereby he crosses over into the gay way. Come on now. No, 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 no. Think about it. Think about it. His squad is this furious gay fighting force, right? They're penises bound together in a common mission, right? So Iceman finally has Maverick on the gay side. They're all kissing and loving on each other. And what's the last line? The very last line. Iceman says, you can be my wingman anytime. And Maverick's like, you can be mine. So sword fight, man, fucking sword fight, fucking A. (laughs) It was your kid crying. Really? We're leaving. There's gotta be a blockbuster somewhere around here. Wait, 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 we got the movie. Letterbox, pen and scan. I don't know what that means. Listen, what is your name? I'm gonna complain to your boss. (sighs) Video archives, hold on, please. Tarantino, Quentin Tarantino. All right, Mr. Tarantino, I am calling your boss today. I hope you're proud of yourself making a child cry. Mm. Kind of, yeah. Sorry, can I help you? Don't be a dick. What? Who the fuck is this? He never graduated high school. He couldn't spell anything. He couldn't remember anything. His handwriting was awful. He couldn't focus. A frustrated first grade teacher once scolded him, I don't see how your parents could love you. No surprise he hated school. And yet, he loved the movies. Those flickering images on the big silver screen. There was nothing pretend about that world. It was as real as anything he could touch, more real than anything he could feel. He saw every movie he could. Pick a movie. He could tell you who starred in it, who directed it, who wrote it, who shot it, and what else they had starred in, directed, wrote, and shot. His mom, Connie, was part Cherokee, part Irish, full of vim and vigor. She was headstrong and 16 years old when she was emancipated from her parents thanks to a hastily arranged marriage to a boy five years older, a struggling actor named Tony Tarantino. And on March 27, 1963, the child bride had a kid of her own. The baby's name was inspired by the blacksmith Burt Reynolds played on TV's Gunsmoke and a character in one of Connie's favorite novels. Whether it was a boy or a girl, one thing was certain, he or she would be named Quentin. Quentin's dad, Tony, didn't stick around long. He wasn't the fatherly type. He was a man his son would never know. The boy would grow up without a father and he would spend his life looking for one. His mother would remarry and settle with her toddler in Torrance, California, just 25 miles from Hollywood. And it might as well be on the other side of the world. As a kid, Quentin Tarantino already had a sharp ear for colorful dialogue. Bullshit. That from a toddler's mouth, a mouth that was often bubbling over with soap. But it didn't matter. Nobody could ever rewrite Tarantino. Bullshit. Not even his mom. Quentin, make your bed. Bullshit. Quentin, pick up your toys. Bullshit. Quentin, brush your teeth and don't say... Bullshit. (sighs) Quentin Tarantino was four years old and his preschool major was profanity and vulgarity. Goddamn son of a bitch. Quentin, was that you? Goddamn straight. What did you say? Mommy, it wasn't me. It was Batman and Spider-Man talking to G.I. Joe.
Quentin was nine when his mom took him to see Deliverance. That's the movie featuring backwoods hillbillies raping Ned Beatty after forcing him to squeal like a pig. You took him to Deliverance? Yep. But he's only 10. Nine. Okay, what's next, Carnal Knowledge? Good idea. Carnal Knowledge is a movie about the sexual exploits of two college roommates. In one scene, Art Garfunkel is trying to convince the girl to have sex with him. Come on, let's do it. I don't want to do it. Come on. Young Quentin tugged on his mom's sleeve. Mommy, what does he want to do? <laughs> Mother's Day at the Tarantino household. Hey, Mom, I wrote you a story. As he got older, he was always writing things. Read it to me, Quentin. Every Mother's Day, another story. Every Mother's Day was about Connie. And in every Mother's Day story about Connie, he killed her off. Alone, in a Kmart, nobody watching. Hey, young man, stop right there. Oops. At 15, Tarantino had his first run-in with the police. And what is that under your arm? It's a, it's a, it's a book. I, I uh, 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 brought it in with me. We monitor every aisle here. We have you on video pulling that book off the shelf. We saw you trying to steal it without paying for I, it. I didn't. No, 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 no. I was, I was going to pay for it. I, I just... You were holding it for somebody. Uh, yeah. You forgot you had it under your arm. Yeah. You were taking the long way to the checkout. Um, yeah? <sighs> Come with me. They hauled Tarantino to the back of the store and called the police. Officer? Ma'am, we're delivering your boy to you. He tried to shoplift a book from the Kmart. He what? The store has agreed not to press charges if you can assure us this will never happen again. Quentin, get in here. Officer, rest assured that if this ever happens again, I will personally tear him limb from limb. The book had a cool name, The Switch. It was by an author Quentin had never read before, Elmore Leonard, an author famous for westerns and crime stories and thrillers. He was a legend of Pulp Fiction, and he was the writer of a book that would one day be adapted into a screenplay by Quentin Tarantino. Tarantino actually went back to that Kmart the next week and bought the book. But in the back of his mind, there was one devious thought. How ballsy would it be if I shoplifted it twice? <laughs> nah. Quentin Tarantino never went to film school. He went to movies, a lot of movies. Many days, he'd take in four a day at 368 midnight, Die Hard, The Godfather, Alien, Scarface, Body Double, and that, that was just one day. Quentin Tarantino was falling in love with film. At home, he'd catch The Late Show. And then The Late Late Show. You couldn't pry him away from the TV when a movie was on. He loved classic horror and vintage comedies, two different genres. And then one day, he saw a movie that changed everything. <laughs> Abbott and Costello, the classic 1940s comedy duo, were facing a long, slow career slide. And so were the famous Universal monsters, Dracula, Frankenstein, and the Wolfman. Funny and scary, two different genres. Well. Why not just put them together in one movie? Universal had a lot of bad ideas in those days, but this wasn't one of them. Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein was a tremendous hit. The effect was cinema magic. A timeless comedy horror classic was born. And seeing the movie on a 13-inch black and white TV in his mother's house, young Quentin Tarantino was enthralled. 
This was the greatest thing he had ever seen. His two favorite things, comedy and horror, together in one movie. Who needs to stick with one genre at a time? Maybe just one thing is a limitation, a sacrifice, a compromise. It's a lesson he would never forget. None of his movies would ever be just one thing. They would always be mixed and matched. They would always be chocolate and peanut butter. Tarantino's in school, and yes, his teacher really does sound like that. At least, that's how she sounded to him. Mr. Tarantino? Uh-oh, that's his name, better pay attention. Mr. Tarantino, the assignment was to do a book report. A book report is not... The book has a blue cover, is nine inches long, and contains 128 pages. <laughs> Oh, great. There's nothing like public humiliation to convince a kid who thinks he doesn't belong that he was right all along. This was torture. School was torture. Tarantino felt like he was starring in Midnight Express, and this school was his own private Turkish prison. <sighs> I've got to get out of here. So, out of here, he got Mom? Here it comes. I'm quitting school. I'm dropping out. Connie was not happy. Quentin was only 16. Now, I know what you're thinking, but I will get a job. A job? What kind of job are you going to get? I am going to be an usher. I've always wanted to work at a movie theater, sir. How old are you, kid? Uh, how old do I have to be? 18. I'm 18. Hmm. You know we only show skin flicks here, right? Skin flicks? Blue movie, stag film. You're sure you're 18? Yes, sir. I was born in uh, the year that would make me 18 now. Mm. Um, sir, why are all the customers in raincoats? There's not a cloud in the sky. You got the job, kid. Great. When do I start? Right now. We need you to clean up the theater between showings. You mean sweep up the popcorn? Ah. Uh, uh, yeah, something like that. Here you are. Mop, bucket, go. In 1983, two industrious movie lovers spied a hollowed-out bike shop in an unexceptional strip mall on North Sepulveda in Manhattan Beach. This would be the spot where their dreams would come true. And dreams weren't about money. God knows this place would barely ever break even. No, these dreams were bigger. This would be a gathering place for cinephiles, movie makers, industry enthusiasts, Hollywood wannabes, and unrepentant fans. All were welcome who shared one thing, a love of movies. Video Archives was not just another movie rental store. Like a used record shop goes deep into the nuance and magic of music, Video Archives was stocked to the rafters with hard-to-find stuff from around the world. Black exploitation, kung fu, European art house, we got them, and a lot more. This was the coolest rental spot in town. The movie nerds shopped here, and the movie nerds worked here, including one young nerd named... Tarantino! What? What are you doing? Eating breakfast. Dude, it's 4.30 in the afternoon. So? Cereal? And this? This is not just cereal. This is Captain Crunch, the cristal of cereals, okay? What are those, what are those round things? Are you kidding? Those are crunch berries, man. Every bowl is a delightful minefield of delicious Fabergé eggs. Why do you like it so much? Mmm. It's like heroin. It's like your mouth is chasing a crunchy dragon, you know? And like heroin, there's a price to pay. You gotta have three bowls, first of all. Mm. And by then, the roof of your mouth is hanging like shards. Little strips of your gums are dangling like stalactites, right? Sounds great. Mm. This cereal is literally the best thing in the world. 
until all of a sudden you feel like you're eating ground glass, right? Like your tongue is scraping against a coral reef and screaming for help. Mm -mm -mm. Then why do you keep eating it? It hypnotizes you. You're tripping on it. And then when you come down off that high, the pain is excruciating. And you realize, oh my God, I'm eating ground glass. My tongue needs a fucking rescue team. Mm. Here, want a bowl? No, no, thanks. The debates weren't usually about breakfast. More often, they were knockdown dragouts about what else? Movies. Quentin, come on. Brian De Palma is B movie Hitchcock. Bullshit. De Palma's blowout is one of the greatest movies ever made. Travolta is riveting in that movie. Oh, uh, get away, get away. Derivative claptrap. What the fuck's a claptrap? You're just doing fanboy film guy 101. You're throwing back a shot at Hitchcock shit don't stink Kool Aid. So you're going to dismiss Hitchcock and Kool Aid? And so it went all the time. And they wouldn't want it any other way. Everyone working at Video Archives wanted to get into the movie business, acting, directing, writing, and none of them were anywhere close. For years, Tarantino would joke, you could address a letter to me, Quentin Tarantino on the outskirts of the industry, and I would have gotten it. But for all their camaraderie, there was one thing missing, and that one thing was a girl. Hey, hey, it's a girl. Quentin, look. Did you ever have that moment where time slows down and literally stops? That moment when you see a face, an amazing face, and your eyes lock and nothing in your life will ever be the same again. Tarantino had seen that moment in the movies, and now here it was in real life. The girl's name was Grace Lovelace. A better name could not possibly have been scripted. Grace became a regular customer, but Tarantino wanted more than that. He would bring up her account on the computer and stare at it like it was a love note from a precious Valentine. How would he get her? He needed an angle, and angles were not his specialty. Ah, uh, excuse me, miss. Um, your name is your name is Grace, right? There seems to be a, a problem uh, with your account. He'd point to her account on the screen. There, instead of her name, was the word Dream girl. I don't know how it happened, but I'm sure happy to change it back for you. Cheesy? You bet. But that time anyway, it worked. Grace was the first girl Tarantino ever fell in love with who loved him back. They were a couple for three years. It was his favorite memory of that time. Not all memories were so sweet. The crew at Video Archives were buddies, but also rivals. They all wanted a ticket to Hollywood. Scott McGill was one of the gang. He helped Tarantino work on a homegrown film called My Best Friend's Birthday. He had worked as an assistant editor on Phantasm, but when he looked around Video Archives, he saw raw talent. He saw success in the making. He felt he couldn't compete. He might as well give up. And so, he stood in the bathroom of his apartment, staring into the mirror. He had a razor blade in one hand. He slashed at his wrist, not deep enough. He slashed at his throat. Too timid, too cautious, too shallow, even in suicide, he was a failure. Blood was all over the floor. He grabbed a towel and mopped it up. He walked up to the roof of his building. He stood there at the edge. This was a beautiful day, a perfect day, a peaceful day. Scott left behind a letter, nine pages long. He wrote 
that he wanted to be a filmmaker more than anything in the world. And he didn't think he had the stamina to make it happen. Disappointment and depression were inevitable, he explained. Failure was inevitable. He didn't want to live like that. And so he didn't want to live at all. Quentin Tarantino was in his 20s now. He sat by the window of his bedroom in his mom's house. She was living in El Segundo near the LA airport. All day long, he'd watch the planes fly in and out. People arriving, departing. People going places. But where was he going? He was getting impatient, itchy. He was an encyclopedia of film at Video Archives, and so what? He had tried acting, years of classes. For what? He landed one job, an Elvis impersonator in an episode of TV's The Golden Girls. No dialogue, 650 bucks. That cash and the residuals that followed would keep him afloat while he worked on scripts with his Video Archives pal, Roger Avery. People arriving, people departing, people going places. Roger always said, if Quentin doesn't make it in the film business, it's very likely he would end up a serial killer. Hmm. Serial killer. Sounds like a movie worth writing. Fade In is created, written, narrated, and directed by Mark Ramsey. Additional voices by Carissa Vacker. Produced by Mark Ramsey. Sound design scoring and mix by Jeff Schmidt. Executive producers Anyel Z. Fields for KCRW and Paul Anderson and Nick Pinella for Workhouse Media. Art direction by Evan Solano. A presentation of KCRW. KCRW.